Hi, my name is Thomas Hannibal and I've set up a training session that will help both you and your company comply with the regulations and guidelines that was published by the Minister of Transport and the Civil Aviation Authority on the 30th of May 2020. Before you can start your operation, both you and your staff have to receive the training that was listed in these publications on infection control measures and the use of PPE. So I've simply put this training session together so that you can induct your staff and get your aeroplanes in the air as soon as possible. So let's get right into it. The name of the course is Infection Control Measures and Personal e Protective Equipment. And there on the next slide you'll see the course objective and goals is simply that you can um, to give you the required knowledge and skills to effectively implement the guidelines of, and regulations as published by the Government Gazette as well as the notices that was published by Civil Aviation Authority. Now as part of the training there's a couple of modules that we're going to cover and they are as follows. We're going to look at the coronavirus and I'm sure you are read up on this by now but we'll give you a short definition there. Hand hygiene, use of PPE, respiratory um, etiquette, cleaning of toilets, sounds interesting, environmental cleaning, process to be followed when disposing of medical waste and material, and in this case that will be your medical masks and your gloves, and then infection prevention control measures for management and the control of suspected cases. And then what are the roles of each member of personnel? So I've got a, a bunch of videos that we're going to show, be showing you in between. I'm going to um, be showing you some of the slides in between. But the purpose of this course is that we can deal with every um, section in, uh, that's listed in the modules and that you and your, as well as your staff and even your students, you're welcome to use this for your students as well, can be trained on all the requirements. So if we look at the presentation, we're going to start with COVID-19. And the video that I'm going to show you is from the World Health Organization. So coronaviruses are a family of viruses um, that range from the common cold to MERS coronavirus, which is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, and SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. Coronaviruses are circulating in animals, and some of these coronaviruses have the capability of transmitting between animals and humans. We call that a spillover event. The coronaviruses typically cause respiratory symptoms, so uh, we recommend uh, basic hand hygiene such as washing your hands with soap and water, and respiratory hygiene uh, such as when you sneeze, sneezing into your elbow. Ways to protect yourself against a potential animal source uh, would be to avoid unnecessary, unprotected contact with live animals um, and to make sure that you wash your hands thoroughly after contact with an animal and also to make sure that your meat is cooked thoroughly before consuming. There are no specific treatments for coronaviruses, but symptoms can be treated. Right, and then next we're going to be looking at the symptoms that you can expect of someone that is infected with COVID-19. And again, I'm going to be showing you a video. This time, the video credit goes to Free Med Education. Day-to-day -day symptoms of COVID-19. Before proceeding, please note that this general overview is compiled for initial self-assessment only and may vary for each individual. If you are not feeling well, you should immediately consult a medical practitioner to have an accurate diagnosis and proper treatment of COVID-19. The typical daily symptoms are concluded from the study of 138 patients at Zhongyang Hospital of Wuhan University and another study involving 135 patients from Jinyin Tan Hospital and 56 patients from Wuhan Pulmonary Hospital. These symptoms are broken down into Day 1 to Day 2. The beginning symptoms are similar to the common cold, with a mild sore throat and neither having a fever nor feeling tired. Patients can still consume food and drink as usual. Day 3. 
The patient's throat starts to feel a bit painful. Body temperature reads at around 36.5 degrees Celsius. Although it's uncommon, other symptoms like mild nausea, vomiting or mild diarrhea are possible to set in. Day 4. Throat pain becomes more serious. Other symptoms like feeling weak and joint pain start to manifest. The patient may show a temperature reading between 36.5 degrees to 37 degrees Celsius. Day 5 to 6. Mild fever starts. The patients show a temperature reading above 37.2 degrees Celsius. The second most common symptom, dry cough, also appears. Dyspnea or breathing difficulty may occur occasionally. Most patients in this stage are easily feeling tired. Other symptoms remain about the same. These four symptoms are among the top five key indications of COVID-19, according to the final report of the initial outbreak conducted by the Joint Mission of China and WHO. Day 7. The patients that haven't started recovering by day 7 get more serious coughs and breathing difficulty. Fever can get higher, up to 38 degrees Celsius. Patients may develop further headache and body pain, or worsening diarrhea if there's any. Many patients are admitted to hospital at this stage. Day 8 to 9. On the 8th day, the symptoms are likely to be worsened for the patient who has coexisting medical conditions. Severe shortness of breath becomes more frequent. Temperature reading goes well above 38 degrees. In one of the studies, day 9 is the average time when sepsis starts to affect 40% of patients. Day 10 to 11. Doctors are ordering imaging tests like chest x-ray to capture the severity of respiratory distress in patients. Patients are having loss of appetite and may be facing abdominal pain. The condition also needs immediate treatment in ICU. Day 12 to 14. For the survivors, the symptoms can be well managed at this point. Fever tends to get better and breathing difficulties may start to cease on day 13. But some patients may still be affected by mild cough even after hospital discharge. Day 15 to 16. Day 15 is the opposite condition for the rest of the minority patients. The fragile group must prepare for the possibility of acute cardiac injury or kidney injury. Day 17 to 19. COVID-19 fatality cases happen at around day 18. Before the time, vulnerable patients may develop a secondary infection caused by a new pathogen in the lower respiratory tract. The severe condition may then lead to blood coagulation and ischemia. Day 20 to 22. The surviving patients are recovered completely from the disease and are discharged from the hospital. Right, next we look at hand hygiene and the video credit goes again to the World Health Organization. Hand washing should take you about one minute. Use a timer or count from 1 to 10 in each of the following steps. Wet hands with water and apply enough soap to cover all surfaces of the hands. Let the water run smoothly to avoid touching the tap later on. Rub hands palm to palm to obtain a good quantity of foam. Then rub right palm over the back of left hand with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Rub again palm to palm with fingers interlaced. Rub the back of your fingers to opposing palms with fingers interlocked, repeating this action for each hand. Rub rotationally left thumb clasped in right palm and vice versa. To clean the tips of the fingers, rub rotationally backwards and forwards with clasped fingers of right hand in left palm and vice versa. Rinse hands thoroughly with running water. Dry hands thoroughly with a single-use towel. If the tap is not elbow operated, use this towel to turn off the tap without touching it directly. Your hands are now clean and safe. Next we look at personal protective equipment. And first off we're going to be looking at how can you properly use and reuse a mask. And the video cred goes to SMH Social. Hi, I'm Jennifer Sorensen. I'm a registered nurse in our education department at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. Sarasota Memorial Hospital is adapting masking guidelines to care for our patients and protect our employees as well as the community. As many of you in the community are choosing to wear masks, we want to ensure that you are wearing them properly. 
Here are some important tips while wearing your mask. Never touch the outside of your mask while your mask is on your face. The mask on the outside is considered dirty. Don't pull your mask below your chin while you're wearing it and have it sitting down here. It should always be fitting properly on your face. Third thing, you don't want to have the mask dangling. You don't want it sitting like this. All of these are gonna create opportunities for cross-contamination of yourself or other surfaces. I wanna cover a few simple steps to keep yourself um, and others safe while wearing your mask. When you first go ahead and pull out a mask, we wanna make sure we identify which side of the mask is the outside of the mask, because the outside of the mask, again, is dirty. Here at the hospital, we're marking the outside of the mask with our initials. For you at home, you may choose to do the same, or you could put something like a star, some type of mark identifying that that's the outside of your mask, because you can see it's the same color on both sides. So that's gonna identify that that's the outside of our mask. The second thing, whenever we're taking our mask off, we wanna make sure it's put into some clean type of area. We wanna store it in a clean area. Here at the hospital, we're using a paper bag. At home, you could use a paper bag as well, or you might choose to use something like a Ziploc baggie. What we don't want to do is put it in an area that's not clean. An area that's not clean would be something like our purse or our pocket. So I am going to go ahead and put my mask on. So to put my mask on, I want to pull it down, make sure it's covering under my chin, make sure it's covering my nose, and make sure it's on nice and secure. So again, I'm not gonna touch the outside. I'm not gonna pull it below my chin, okay? I need to now remove my mask for whatever reason. First thing I'm gonna do is clean my hands. So I'm gonna perform hand hygiene. I can do that with soap and water or hand sanitizer. When I remove my mask, I'm gonna do that from a clean area. So I'm gonna remove my mask from the ear loops. I wanna inspect this mask to make sure I can reuse it. So has my mask been um, compromised at all? Is it wet? Is it visibly soiled? If it is, I wanna go ahead and I wanna throw it away. I would then go ahead and uh, perform hand hygiene, wash my hands with soap and water, or again, using my hand sanitizer. If it's okay to reuse, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna fold over my mask. I'm gonna fold it in half and folding it so the outside surfaces are touching each other. And I'm gonna place it carefully into my clean storage. If it's a paper bag, I wanna seal it over, so fold it over. If it's a Ziploc bag, I would go ahead and seal my Ziploc bag. Perform hand hygiene, because I still touched probably some edge of my mask that was potentially dirty. And now it's in a nice clean area. To reapply my mask, okay? So to reapply, I would probably wash my hands first, perform that hand hygiene, open up my bag. When I first go to grasp it, I wanna grasp it from the ear loops. I wanna look to find where is the outside of my mask? Where are those initials? Where's that mark? Cause that's the outside, putting it on by the ear loops, okay? And trying to use the ear loops to kind of get it tucked under my chin. And then you're gonna kind of need to secure it to your face. So you are touching the outside of the mask for a second. So then again, I'm gonna perform hand hygiene, wash my hands with soap and water, or again, use my hand sanitizer. And I'm ready to go. For the employees at the hospital, at the end of your shift, at the end of the day, you would remove your mask and you're gonna throw it away at the end of your shift. Those are our tips for ensuring that you are utilizing proper masking guidelines. Thank you so much. Stay safe and stay healthy. Right, and then for those of you that use cloth masks, I've got another video and the video credit goes to I hope I Ohio Health. Hi, this is Dr. Joe Gustaldo, and I'm here to show you how to apply a facial mask. 
uh, I am going to introduce you guys to some new words, donning and doffing. Uh, so you can now incorporate those words into your vocabulary. Uh, this is a clean mask that has been freshly laundered. I'm touching now only the elastic part of it. Before you put the mask on, you have to wash your hands, clean your hands, get rid of all of the germs, all the bacteria, all the viruses on your hands because we want to keep this as antiseptic and clean as possible. So after your hands are clean, you, take, you only touch it on the elastic part, put it around my ear, make sure there's a good, it's on there. I'm going to only touch it down here in the very bottom, get a nice seal. Make sure my nose and my mouth are covered and it's on. I could talk, I could sing, and the whole point of wearing the mask is to protect myself from giving the virus to other people in the event that I have asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic COVID-19. Having this mask on is going to help me protect from not spreading the virus to others. Taking it off is the same way. I'm only going to touch the elastic part and not touch the cloth. Remove it. It's off, dispose this and sanitize it. And the last thing you do is wash your hands before you touch anything after the mask is removed. Right, and then still on PPE, now we're looking at the use of gloves and the video credit goes to Pro Trainings Europe Limited. One of the main fears of first aid is the fear of infection. This is especially prevalent in today's world with the outbreak of COVID-19. And people may not solely be wearing gloves during first aid, but also in everyday life as well. There's lots of different types of gloves and you might see different colors, but they're all quite straightforward to use. Most gloves nowadays are either nitrile or vinyl. When putting gloves on, make sure that you have nothing sharp on your hands, such as rings or bracelets, as these can break the gloves material. Also check the gloves before putting them on to make sure there are no holes in them. You can do this by pushing air in to see if any air escapes. Should you find a hole, put a new pair on. Put the gloves onto your hand and pull them down your wrists. Should there be more than one patient on the scene, you must change your gloves between the patients as the gloves will harbour any infection and you will just end up passing the infection from one patient to the other. So for each patient, wear a new pair of gloves. When removing the gloves, you don't want to touch any body fluids on the gloves, so there are special ways to take the gloves off, which is much more careful than when putting the gloves on. First of all, pinch one glove on the outside and then remove it, turning the glove inside out in the process. What this does, it keeps any contaminants on the inside. Another good thing about doing this is if there are any dressings, tissues or anything that may harbour contaminations, you can scrunch them up in your hand before taking the first glove off and then contain it in the inside out glove. Once you've taken off the first glove, keep hold of it in your other hand and scrunch it up into a ball in your gloved hand. Then put the non-gloved finger underneath the second glove without touching the outside and pull the glove fully off, again turning it inside out with the contaminated things on the inside. Finally, you want to dispose of it correctly, which can be done in anything such as a biohazard bin, a sanitary bin, or securely double bagged in your rubbish. Right, now we move on to respiratory etiquette, a sensitive one, and the video credit goes to the Veterans Health Administration. You hear the coughs and sneezes, but it's what you don't see that might make you sick. For example, this patient may be leaving more than just his signature behind. Of course, he didn't spread all these viruses and bacteria by himself. You could say a lot of people had a hand in it. Viruses and bacteria travel from person to person, person to a surface, and from a surface to the next person that touches that surface. This patient could make the world a little healthier by using disposable tissues instead of a handkerchief and 
disposing of the used tissue in a wastebasket, and then washing his hands with soap and water. Cleaning with an alcohol-based rub is also an option. We've been taught to cover our mouths when we cough, <coughs> but if you have a cold and you're in a crowd, you should do more. Wearing a mask prevents you from spreading germs to the people nearby, to surfaces around you, and to anything you touch. If no mask is available, it's better to cough into your upper sleeve than your hand. <coughs> it's not the perfect precaution, but at least you keep your hands relatively germ-free. When it comes to respiratory etiquette, a few good manners are good for everybody's health. Right, and now we look at a personal favorite, the cleaning of toilets and restrooms. Video credit here is going to go to Leonard Paper. I don't know if it's Leonard Toilet Paper, but here we go. While restrooms represent one of the smallest areas in a facility, they are the source of many customer complaints. Restrooms often need extra attention as they can be difficult to clean. The right procedures, using the right products, and inspecting your work will help ensure a positive experience for patrons. The following will show the procedures for daily cleaning of the restroom. To begin, put on the required personal protective equipment. Before you begin the cleaning process, gather the necessary cleaning products including disinfectant cleaner, glass cleaner, toilet bowl cleaner, and floor cleaner. Also, gather consumable items such as toilet paper, paper towels, seat liners, hand soap, and other consumable items that might be needed. Prior to entering the restroom, knock and announce yourself and prop the door open. Then, close the restroom for cleaning. Next, post wet floor signs. Check and refill soap and consumable dispensers. Apply toilet bowl cleaner to the interior of toilets and urinals. Then, apply a disinfectant cleaner to the exterior of toilets and urinals. Apply a disinfectant cleaner to sinks, countertops, and all frequently touched surfaces. Next, clean the mirrors with a glass cleaner. Clean and wipe the exterior of dispensers. Then, wipe the sinks, countertops, and high-touch surfaces. Next, spot clean walls and partitions. Using a toilet brush, clean the interior of toilets and urinals. Wipe down the exterior of toilets and urinals. Designating different colored microfiber cloths to different surfaces in the restroom helps prevent cross-contamination. For example, you wouldn't want to use a microfiber cloth to clean a toilet and then use the same cloth to clean a door handle. Next, empty all trash receptacles. Tie the trash bag and remove the liner by pulling it straight out. Never push trash down with your hands. Once emptied, replace the liner. Next, thoroughly sweep the floor. Then, damp mop the floor using a floor cleaner. Be sure to change mop water frequently. Do not mop the floor with dirty water. After the floor has completely dried, Visually inspect your work. Remove personal protective equipment and wash your hands. Then, remove wet floor signs and open the restroom for traffic. Remember, 
immediately report any broken or malfunctioning fixtures or equipment to a member of management. After cleaning the restroom, clean and check your equipment for damage. Then, check the supply closet for inventory and stock your cart for its next use. Right, then next we look at the environmental cleaning and keeping your personal workspace clean. And there's a very informative video this time from McGill University. It is not yet known how long the virus causing COVID-19 lives on surfaces. However, early evidence suggests it can live on objects and surfaces from a few hours to days. Surfaces frequently touched with hands are most likely to be contaminated. These include doorknobs, handrails, elevator buttons, light switches, cabinet handles, faucet handles, tables, countertops, and electronics. Building services will increase cleaning and disinfection of public spaces, including washrooms, doors and entrance ways, elevators, drinking fountains, handrails, and other high-touch surfaces. In labs or offices, building services will only clean the floor and empty regular waste and recycling bins. Occupants will be responsible for cleaning and disinfection of their own workspaces at the beginning and end of each shift. Products that both clean and disinfect are most effective. Gloves should be worn when cleaning. In addition to routine cleaning, surfaces that are frequently touched with hands should be cleaned and disinfected more often, as well as when visibly dirty. Contaminated disposable cleaning items should be placed in a lined garbage bin before disposing with regular waste. Wash hands with soap and water or use alcohol-based hand sanitizer after removing gloves. All McGill-owned vehicles must be disinfected at the beginning of a shift and between drivers. Surfaces that must be cleaned include If everyone stays vigilant, we will minimize the risk of spreading the virus and contribute to a safer workplace. Please visit the McGill Coronavirus website for more information. Now in most cases, it's more important how you get rid of your, your mask and your gloves than wearing them in the first place. So we've got two modules that's just quickly going to talk specifically on after you've worn masks as well as gloves, how do you dispose of them? And the video cred this time goes to Mr. Q. similar is how do we dispose of our medical masks and the video credit here goes to Yanami Lifestyle.
And then for our last video, we're looking at infection prevention control procedures for management and the control of su suspected cases. So the World Organization has also got a very good video that I'm using that will show us how to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. Preventing COVID-19 in your workplace or while teleworking. There are several things you can do to protect yourself and others from COVID-19 in your workplace, whether you are at your work site or teleworking at home. Follow distancing measures issued for your location and stay informed through information from trusted sources, such as WHO and your local health authority. Stay at home and avoid direct contact with anyone if you feel unwell or even have a mild cough. This will help protect your colleagues at work and your family members at home. If you are feeling well and need to go to work, you can reduce your risk of catching the virus by avoiding crowded public transport. If possible, go by bike or walk. Otherwise, if possible, discuss with your supervisor if you can work from home. At work or at home, if you can, use the stairs instead of elevators. Avoid using your hands to touch common objects like elevator buttons, door handles or staircase railings. If you work in an office, create distance-based meetings either through video conferencing or by maintaining at least one metre space between people in the same room. If you work in contact with the public, stay at least one metre away from others as much as you can. After commuting to and from work and throughout the day, clean your hands frequently and thoroughly. Avoid touching your eyes, mouth and nose. Ventilate your workplace regularly, keeping the windows open if possible. Make sure tables, door handles and other frequently touched surfaces are disinfected regularly. Avoid crowded places and unnecessary public activities. Find no contact ways to greet your colleagues and express affection to your friends and family. While maintaining physical distance, stay social. Contact your family and colleagues regularly to check how they are coping. Remember to seek ways to stay active and positive. Stay healthy and let's all prevent the spread of COVID-19. Okay, great. So now that we know how to avoid COVID-19 and the spread thereof and to wash our hands and to keep safe and to social distance and all those nice things that we've heard on TV um, over and over again the last couple of weeks, there are a couple of practical things that as a company you have to put in place, systems you've got to put in place, and then there's specific records that you need to keep as well. So probably the most important thing is after everyone has now been inducted, you're going to have to have a formal screening process from the moment that someone walks into your door to report for duty or to report for a training flight or for a charter flight, doesn't matter. There's going to have to be a certain procedure to follow. So I'm going to just quickly touch on that before we end. So we're looking at employee, student or client screening. Now, first of all, it's important that you decide who will do the screening. So there's a few options. Um, and you can either get employees to take their own temperature or, and then show someone at the reception the, the thermometer and they'll write it down. Or you can have someone dedicated that takes everyone's temperature with one of these temperature guns. And that is probably the best um, and the most independent option that you can have. Then consider the safety requirements. The person conducting this, the screening should wear the appropriate personal protection equipment, like we've demonstrated in all these videos now. So the, the guy that's going to be taking everyone's temperatures obviously also needs to be dressed up with a mask, with gloves, and keep a safe distance. And then what's important as a company, and that's internal, but you need to decide where are you going to do the screening. Obviously, crowd control comes into it a little bit. You want to um, probably 
catch the guys or anyone entering your building before they even get into the building. So uh, reception is normally a good place to redirect everyone to the screening room or if reception is the screening room they can sign the register and we'll get into all those details now but good practice is that the guys will come in they'll sign a register maybe comment on um, 72 hour history where they were take the temperature temperature should not um, be, be be higher than 37.5 37 is already high but if you get someone that's got a, a highish temperature then you're going to obviously take it more than more than once so let's just quickly have a look here we've now said we've determined who's going to do the screening for us where we're going to do the screening that's important and then we need to develop a process now for those of you that sit in my quality classes if there's a process that we're going to follow, it needs to be a formalized process. So there has to be an SOP written, there has to be a procedure to say, this is how we're going to do it so that everyone in the company can follow it. Maintain privacy, that's obviously important. So employers should consider having employees who do not pass the screening protocols move to, um, to a safe and private area to discuss the next steps. So we're not going to embarrass anyone. At the same time, we want to keep our environment safe because if they are, there is an outbreak in any one of our companies we'll have to close the doors for at least 14 days and I think with all the delays we cannot afford, we simply cannot afford that. So respect the privacy and then develop the documentation process. So employees should develop or determine what information will be documented, how it will be documented and where such documents will confidentially um, be stored. Now Part of the CIA notice that was issued yesterday on the 30th of May, you'll see that there are certain requirements. They ask us there to keep record of the screening process, keeping record of any incidences and so on. So it's very, very important that we don't just take this information down, but your record keeping and the filing of that is very, very important should the audit come up and we need to show CIA that information. Okay, then communicate the skidding process to all employees. So once you've um, developed your SOP internally, and I've got a sample for you, so if you need help with that, please contact me, then I can help you with that. But you formalize your process. Once you've formalized your process, then you communicate it to all your employees, your clients, your staff, and the students, of course, that are going to fly with you. And then send employees, students, clients home if they have a fever or if they refuse to be tested. Unfortunately, if someone is not willing to be screened at this stage, it's better not to let them inside the organization. So anyone refusing required testing should be denied entry into the workplace. And if a person has a fever upon being screened, consider checking that person one or two more times um, Sometimes it is the machine that's faulty, and by doing it one or once or twice more, you should be able to get an accurate reading. So what we're saying here is if, if at least two checks show a fever, the person will have to be sent home with specific instructions. And then there's a, a different process that we're going to follow if someone has been screened and we pick up something on the screening. So provide instructions to an employee, student, client who is sent home due to a fever. As soon as feasible, you should inform the employee, student or client in writing when they will be permitted to return to work, what the procedures are. I think it's, um, you know, from a client protection point of view, you don't want anyone to feel alienated. You don't want anyone to feel that they're being discriminated against. And the best remedy for that is always communication, communication, communication. So make sure that your communication is on par and in a case like this, in writing is always the best. Then follow up with those who are sent home. So check in with the guys if they are right. You should make sure to follow up with um, or to see both how the employees or students or clients are feeling and to determine if they have either tested positive or has obtained medical advice indicating a likely COVID-19 diagnosis. So you need to Obviously, not just phone them to hear, you know, what your side or how it's going to affect you. 
but you know be human find out what's going on with them if they are okay and then find out if they have gone for the testing if they have tested positive positive or not if they have tested positive obviously there's further procedures because then we need to look at everyone that they have had contact with etc so establish return to work procedures individuals sent home with a fever should not return to work until the following criteria is met First one here is individuals certify in writing that they are fever free and have been completely symptom free. That means no coughs, no chills, no symptoms consistent with COVID-19 for at least three days. And that at least seven days have passed since the later or the latter. So in other words, they've been um, clean for three days, but then seven days after that, and then the last one year they must provide documentation from a medical provider confirming that they can return to work or school and that they're negative so either a declaration a letter a written declaration from them or a letter from a, a medical professional and that just helps you with all the legal issues that might come you know should anyone at your workplace be affected now we're going to be looking at the roles of each member of personnel most important here is you have to have a COVID-19 compliance officer. So this is a go-to person. This is the person that must make sure that all the COVID-19 regulations and requirements and guidelines that has been stipulated by CAA, that we follow them. So appoint someone, preferably someone that's at work all the time and someone that can be trusted, someone that can take responsibility and if your receptionist is that person, that's a perfect match because everyone is probably going to walk past reception on their way in inside the door. But the person has to um, be acknowledged. In other words, everyone has to know who they are. So probably best to put up a poster to say our COVID-19 compliance officer is Sarah Johnson. Here's all the contact details and make it visible so that everyone can see that. Okay, so what's important here? The employee must designate an employee in writing. Okay, so it's an, it's an appointment. There has to be a written appointment as a compliance of, officer whose duties are to ensure that. And just quickly on that, anything that we don't put in writing, when it, there is a dispute coming, then we can say, well, I didn't know I was the official compliance officer, or whatever the case may be. Put it in writing to get the guys to sign and accept the responsibilities. And in aviation, that's what we do with all the other positions. So just follow the same protocol. The COVID-19 prevention mes measures are complied with. This is what their duties are. The COVID-19 health and hygiene protocols that we've now described in the videos are complied with. The workplace plan is complied with. And then the name of the compliance officer must be displayed in a visible area or be communicated to the employees that I've already said. And then the requirement for the appointment of the compliance officer applies to all industries, businesses, entities. So obviously for aviation, that is important as well. Now what we're going to be looking at next is the cleaning. Obviously, we have to keep our surfaces clean. We have to keep the bathrooms clean because um, if the COVID-19 gets on any of the surfaces, there is a chance that someone can, 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 can contract the virus. So we've got that detailed video showing us exactly how to clean the bathroom without infecting yourself. That's a very good video. Um, and this last video that we showed also talks about keeping our surfaces clean. But just a couple of pointers for cleaning staff. Wear disposable gloves to clean and disinfect. So don't do that with your hands. Clean surfaces. And then obviously, once you've cleaned, then you need to dispose of the gloves in the way that we've shown you. Clean surfaces using soap and water, and then only use the disinfectant. And the reason for that is when we're cleaning it with soap and water, we reduce the number of germs, dirt, and impurities, and then the disinfectant will kill the germs on the surfaces. So we need both. And then practice routine cleaning and frequently touched um, surfaces. The best is to set up a roster 
get someone that's responsible for it, like they do in the restaurants, or they used to do in the restaurants, write the, the a, a time schedule out, and then every now and again it has to be cleaned after the surfaces are, have been cleaned, and these are surfaces, that, you know, all the surfaces that get touched all the time, countertops, your um, door handles, bathroom. Every time it gets cleaned, someone can write that in the roster, so it's easy to, to track that as well. And then more frequent cleaning and disinfectant or f infection may be required based on the level of use. So if obviously no one is there during the day, you don't have to clean it five times. But if there's a, a healthy stream of people in and through the, the building, make sure that everyone stays clean and the surfaces stay clean. So surfaces and objects in public places such as point of sale keypads should be cleaned and disinfected before each use. That's for the guys handling money. It's not in the course here, but obviously if you don't have to receive cash and you can rather get someone to pay by card or EFT, that helps as well to limit the, the contact. And then high-touch surfaces include things like tables, doorknobs, light switches, countertops, handles, desks, phones, keyboards, toilets, etc., etc. Okay, so we normally... Uh, Almost done, yeah? We can't stress it much, uh, enough. It's a shared responsibility. Everyone has suffered the last couple of weeks without an income, without being able to work, without being able to fly. We need the economy to operate. We need the flying schools to operate. You need your company to operate. And um, it's a shared responsibility. So all staff members share in this responsibility, the students um, share in this responsibility. And what is the shared responsibility? Good hygiene. Be careful of meetings and, and travel, so don't travel unnecessary, only travel when it's absolutely necessary. Make sure you follow the right protocols, make sure you follow the right legal procedures. And then if you can rather have a Zoom meeting, have a Zoom meeting instead of meeting in person. If you don't need to do that. I think if, if anything, this lockdown has shown us that it's okay to have a Zoom meeting. It actually works out quite well and you don't have to travel. So I'll be using a lot more of those. And then social distancing. This is our shared responsibility. Now the record keeping is very important because remember this is where the legal stuff comes in. CIA said a few things in their notice. They said they're not going to approve your procedures. But first of all, you need to write procedures. How are you going to make sure that you stay safe, your operations stay safe? If you need help with that, contact me. I can help you set up a procedure for your company. But that has to be set up. Although CA is not even going to look at it now, if they come to visit you at an audit, they will ask for that. So get that in place, a procedure, because we work, obviously, there needs to be a procedure in place and then we implement according to the procedure. Then the second thing that's important is your screening records. So the screening procedures that we've decided now or that I've you know, given you guidance on, remember every company can set up their own set of procedures. Do what works for you, but follow the minimum requirement and the international standard. At this stage, we, 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 we bless that there's an international standard. We can see what the guys are doing at the shops already that have been open. We, we, we know what they've, um, you know, there's a lot of guidance material available. So follow the industry standard and you will be safe. But the important thing is the screening records, you have to keep a record of that. In South Africa, we keep records for five years. So make sure that every day, um, Someone is responsible, probably your compliance officer, your COVID compliance officer, to keep those records and they have to be on file. Then incidents, if there's any incidents, we need to keep the paperwork for that. And then, very important here, a signed training declaration. I started off the training to say that all your staff and students, um, probably not your students, although they need to um, be inducted before they start flying. But your staff have to undergo training as per the guidelines and the regulations that was published in the Government Gazette and on CIA's website. So, and that is why I made this video. 
I thought if we put all of this together, that will help you to comply and you can focus on getting your shop ready to um, get towards getting the aircraft in, this, in the skies where they belong. So, important, sign training declarations. So don't let the guys just attend training. Make sure you can, there's, there's a couple of options. I'm going to send you this training video in a YouTube link. So you can either share that with all your students, all your staff, all your clients and get them to acknowledge either on seams if you're using seams or when they come into the office they have to acknowledge that they have received the training and that they take full responsibility and then last of all here is your risk assessment so your quality or your not your quality your safety officer has to do a risk assessment of the current situation um, for those of you that were flying during level four you have to have in place a risk assessment for level four. Now you have to amend that risk assessment to level three. And as we progress through the levels, maybe you're going to go back to level four or level five. Or oh, no, forgive me, I did not say that. Um, we're only going, it's only going to go better. So if you move now from level three to level two, your risk assessment changes. If you lose, move from level two to level one, your risk assessment changes. If you need help with that, please do ask. I will help you without any concern. Okay, and then the last thing here is just sources and credits. I've obviously used a lot of videos because that's the best way to learn. I've mentioned them as we went along, so I'm not going to name all of them now. But obviously all the training is in compliance or in reference with the world organization. And that's all from me. So thank you very much for sitting and listening. This is almost an hour, but I think this is a great tool that can help you get started and get your aircraft in the air as soon as possible. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope this helped. And stay positive, test negative. And hopefully we'll see you very soon in the air.